to welcome you all again on behalf of the landscape department in the session of day 2 of winter workshop ecocultural riparian restoration so for the morning session we have a very eminent speaker with us dr and professor amita sinha she did her phd in architecture from university of california at berkeley in 1989 where she had worked with claire cooper marcus she has a former professor in the department of landscape architecture at university of illinois urbana champaign 1989 to 2018 and has taught in the department of architecture and regional planning iit kharagpur 2018 and 19 and in the humanities and social sciences department at iit gandhinagar january to feb 2020 She is the author of Landscapes in India: Forms and Meanings, and the editor editor of Landscape Perception and co-editor of Cultural Landscapes of South Asia: Studies in Heritage Conservation and Management. Her articles have been published in Indian as well as international journals. So, a very warm welcome to Dr. and Professor Amita Sinha. Now, the audience is yours, ma'am. Thank you, Anupama. I'm happy to be part of this uh, very interesting, exciting workshop. and i'd like to speak on um, river betwa today uh, especially the part of betwa that flows along the famous ocha fort so i am going to discuss uh, natural and cultural heritage of the landscape of betwa river front and we know that ocha is a very well known historic town renowned for its magnificent palaces and temples and so it is on the international tourism circuit because of its proximity to khajrao in fact one one third of the visitors to orcha are from outside india and among the domestic tourists it's pilgrims who dominate the river betwa has an integral role in the founding of orcha and the evolution of its cultural landscape as an anchor for the ramayan narrative and this landscape is in the riparian zone and it needs to be managed and interpreted to conserve um, natural and cultural heritage uh, of of the river so a uh, bundelkhand plateau is part of the greater vindhyachal plateau north of the vindhyachal mountain range and what we see here is that there are ridges with quartz veins um sandstone ridges running northeast southwest and they are crossed at right angles by basaltic dikes there are three rivers um betwa naman and ken um the tributaries have carved uh, very narrow and deep valleys um upstream and downstream you know they mostly ravines towards the north so seasonal streams uh, spring up during monsoons um tracing the courses in a dendritic pattern through the rocky rock, rocky plateau in the alluvial plain mostly we find teak forests um because the soil is sandy loam and disintegrated basaltic deccan tribe deccan trap and on the plateau we see mostly scrub jungles of mahua uh, kardai khair So Betwa's origin is actually in a kund in Pariyatra hill near Bhopal and uh, the river merges with the Yamuna at Hamirpur in Uttar Pradesh the demon Batrasur is said to have dug the kund from which Betwa flows the river known as Vetravati or Vetravanti in earlier times is ascribed great purity and power in ancient Hindu texts described as a ganga of kalyug it's supposed to wash away all sins accruing in the sinful age similar to other rivers of the vindhyan vindhyan range it's regarded as a symbol of shakti so there's a dialogue you know between shiva and parvati in padma puran and says that the river destroys all sins even though those incurred by criticizing the vedas and brahma puran refers to betwa as a uh, flowing past the ashram of sage parashar while the epic mahabharat describes it as a place where the sage bhrigu performed yagya and the tunga arinya forest on the banks of betwa uh, was a tapovan uh, where ascetics did the penance in the ashrams and taught the vedas and purified the wilderness of its evil 
So the Bundelas rose to power as the Chandela influence waned in this region. And the Bundelas claimed to be Surya Vanshis, tracing their lineage to love, Lord Ram's son. Bundela name was given to one Hemkaran, who was dispossessed of his inheritance by his brothers. So he offers his head in sacrifice to the great mother goddess in the forest of Bindyachal. And Mundela derives from the boon or the drop of blood that appeared when he attempted to cut his head off. The Bundelas ruled for 500 years, uh, first at Mahoni and then at Garkunda, before they moved to Orcha in 1531. They acquired the reputation of being warlike and a thorn on the side of the mighty Mughals. When Rudra Pratap Singh selected the site of Orcha to build a fort, he ushered in a new era of consolidation, acquisition of new territories, of building palaces and temples, and of patronizing literary and performing arts. So Betwa's two tributaries, Jamnir and Gurari, merged with it um, at the site at Orsha. So the many streams and the islands that they created are known as Satdhara. The citadel was built on an island in the river Betwa as a Jaldurg, according to site planning and design principles codified in the medieval Shilpi Shastras. Now the Orsha fort is unique since all other forts in Buddhilkand even those in proximity to Betwa are hill forts. The site selection for the Jal Durg was guided by defense requirements. The fort was made inaccessible by waters all around it, even as it was made auspicious by the fording of streams. So the citadel rose on the island like Mount Meru from the cosmic ocean. This is an archetypal image resonant with the idea of cosmos. For the down south, the cenotaphs are a unique group of monuments built over a period of time as memorials for the Bundela rulers. They're called Chhatris. And they're not really mausoleums, but they're sites of cremation commemorated in the square Panchayana temple form uh, uh, with four smaller towers surrounding a large central tower. So they rise over the confluence of Gurari with Betwa like an axis mandi, linking symbolically the heavens, earth, and other world. They're reflected in the waters floating upon it, and they provide a very arresting skyline above the bathing devotees in the boulder-strewn river. As the sun sets behind the chatris on winter solstice, they are reflected in the betwa, resulting in a spectacular vision of the place where the sun completes its journey around the earth. So these commemorative memorial towers were built really as symbolic representations of the world pillar rising out of the waters, reaching to the sky, prom promising renewal and rebirth. So the landscape of Orsha evolved over time as the barren wilderness was slowly transformed into the picturesque capital of Bundelkhand. In fact, the settlement derives its name from the phrase Ondoche, meaning low or hidden. And the site was indeed um, uh, bowl-like. Uh, it, it was buffered with bluffs and forests, three sides, um, and the river um, on its east. Orcha Wildlife Sanctuary, covering an area of 46 square kilometers, was established in 1994 near Betwa. Now, it is a forest reserve with flora typical of Bundelkhand region, Kardai, Bhava, Teak, Khair, and Palash. Its fauna includes uh, spotted deer, nilgai, wild boar, blue bull, peacock, monkey. Boat watching, canoeing, river rafting, trekking, and camping are its main attractions. So it's very likely that Vastavidya principles were used for the planning of this island fort, although there is no documented record. Among the Buddhilkand hill forts, Orcha Fort is unique in being a Jaldurg, and it represents a singular achievement of its medieval builders. 
natural features of the site, that is the Betwa and its tributaries, and the presence of natural dike made the Jaldurg possible. So it is roughly polygonal. The fort walls rise uh, above the river and the moat uh, on one side, on the west. And it kind of tapers sharply to the north and to the south. So the walls were built 12 degrees east of north. But parallel to the moat, made from deepening uh, tributary of Betwa, named Adwar. And so this orientation determined the alignment of many buildings within the fort, including the historic temples. The buildings in the inner fort, however, including the royal palaces, um, Raja Mahal, uh, Jahangir Mahal, were oriented in the east-west axis, as was the Chaturbhuj temple built outside the island. But this marking of the cardinal axis, this east-west axis, um, in the center of the island actually sets a very, a, a very interesting spatial dynamic uh, with the outer buildings um, tilted at an angle. The outer buildings are um, at right angles to the alignment of the fort. But these buildings in the inner fort are oriented in the cardinal direction. So the monuments of Orcha represent the epitome of Bundela style of architecture, particularly those built in the 16th, 17th century, dating back to Beach Singh Dev's reign um, and before. So the palaces, um, uh, Raja Mahal, um, Jahangir Mahal, they show a gradual re refinement in Palatine architecture. So they're based upon the introverted courtyard type and they're highly evolved formal exercises in composition and massing, detailing, and play of solids and voids. They belong to the family of Param Saika Vastu Purush Mandal form, that is a square subdivided into smaller squares and rectangles with open spaces in the center. Jangir Temple built um, uh, uh, in the highest point within the island citadel is the most spectacular and shows the cosmopolitan influence at work. So while its direct precedent is Tomar architecture in Gwalior, it assimilated Sultanate influence into Rajput architectural vocabulary and was the model for the early Mughal palaces such as Jahangir Palace in Agra Fort. So we see many innovative gestures in Ocha palaces, which mark the achievement of Bundela style. That is the open courtyard, um, alternating with pavilions at higher stories, such that the interior open spaces formed an inverted pyramid. Chhatris and domes break up the roof line, projecting walls, jali corridors, brackets, and balconies enliven the blank outer surfaces. Murals, styles, and ornamentation make the interiors visually interesting and tactile. Now, Chaturpuj temple has the Bundela octagonal shikhar like a pine cone, and it's got a dome over the mandap, large open interior to accommodate large numbers of worshippers, and a cross axial plan. Vaishnava mythology has imprinted uh, the cultural landscape of Ocha in a very significant way. The epic Ramayana has inspired the flowering of Bandila arts. We see that in palace and temple murals, in iconography of some temples. Manbasi and Chitraku temples. We see that in literary productions of the most famous poet, Keshav Das, and in the participation of the entire community in festivals and processions marking the ep events in the epic. The most famous legend is that of Ganesh Kuwari, queen of the Orcha ruler Madhukar Shah, uh, bringing Lord Ram from Ayodhya. So the legend has it that the idol appeared in River Saryu when she threatened to jump into the river and accompanied her as she traveled on foot in the eight month long journey from Ayodhya to Orcha. The story goes that Lord Ram refused to move from Rani Mahal where he was installed as the Chaturbhuj temple had not yet been completed. So thus the palace became the Ram Raj temple, the center of Orcha 
from where Lord Ram rules over his kingdom. Bundela kings sought to model their values and code of conduct after Lord Ram and shape the society in the image of utopian Ram Raj. Places associated with this exile of Ram with Sita and Lakshman are the archetypal landscapes of Tapovan, Vatika and Garden Grove. So sites in Urcha celebrate the Rama narrative through temple building in forests in the outer fort and across the Betva. So this is the inner fort wall. And um, now these temples are dilapidated today, but um, they include uh, Vanvasi, Radhika Raman, Chitrakut, um, alluding in their iconography to Ram, Sita, and Lakshman's exile in the forest. Uh, there are Shiva temples as well, Panchmukhi and Shiva temples, smaller structures meant for private worship of the royals and their courtiers. The building Yakshala was for um, the sacrificial rites that the ascetics performed in the forest. So a bridge leads across the Betwa to the wildlife sanctuary. Chitrakut's temple is built um, on the eastern side um, uh, of the island, rising above the Betwa. In the Urcha Wildlife Sanctuary are the remnants of the island fort of Ravan, the small um, shrine at the site of Ashok Vatika, where Sita was held captive. Another shrine depicts the journey of Ram, Sita, and Lakshman in relief. Further north, where Betwa meets its tributary Jamnir, is Sangam Point, alluding to the Sangam of Ganga and Yamuna, crossed by the three in their journey to the south. So this is how the Ramayana narrative was imprinted on Betwa's uh, riverfront through the process of spatial transposition. And the toponymy reveals the cultural landscape of narrative play markers, where temples were built to commemorate Ram's victory over demonic forces, thus purifying the wilderness of its evil. Today, the riverfront is a destination of many festival um, processions, um, most important of which are those that end in immersion of idols in the river. So Betwa is used for ritual bathing, washing clothes, and recreational activities such as boating and rafting. Pilgrims visit Orcha temples in large numbers on uh, Makar Sankranti, Vasant Panchmi, Ram Naomi, Ram Viva Pancham, and Kartik Purnima. And these fairs draw large crowds from Jhansi, Tikamgar, and nearby towns and villages. So the narrow ghats on the Betwa are inadequate for large public gatherings, and the river receives all the waste from the town. This is a scenic spot for tourists who are found in large numbers on the rocky boulders interacting with the waters. So we had studied this landscape in a design workshop about eight years ago, and we proposed design strategies for landscape reclamation and site interpretation. So Vandelkhand does not have enough land under irrigation. Many of its district, districts are often drought stricken. At Urcha, only 16% of the land is farmed. Forests cover about 22% and 39% of the land is lying fallow because of lack of water in spite of the proximity of Betwa. So here is this um, island fort, the Jaldurg. This is a town. Um, this is the furthermost uh, te um, temple, um, the Khmerian temple on the east. In the south are the cenotaphs. This is the outer wall of um, Urcha. So, and so much of the land is actually fallow. So the mapping of uh, seasonal streams, um, nalas, and other water catchment areas revealed that rainwater harvesting on a large scale on the outskirts of Orcha town can be done in these, um, in these areas. So we proposed a series of um, low-lying macro catchments linked by a nala and fed by monsoon runoff from adjacent hillocks. And along them, we proposed actually um, a trail that would take um, visitors to the historic city walls and its gateways. 
on this ecocultural trail connecting working landscapes with heritage sites. Um, we can see magnificent views of the temples and palaces of Orcha. The shaded trail uh, would begin uh, from the city gateway on the north, um, and it would end with the cenotaphs uh, on the river bank. On the way, you know, proposed bird sanctuary, community gardens for growing flowers, for temple worship, and the rest stops. Now, as of uh, a few years ago, um, there was no sewerage system in Orcha, and only one in four houses had a toilet facility with a septic tank. So Nalis collect household wastewater as well as stormwater and drain them into the moat and the river. They're built with sufficient gradient, but they're frequently choked because of waste dumping. And this, of course, can be prevented by covering them with a removable lightweight metallic crates. So presently, um, both the north-south and the east-west streets are only partially lined with Nali's. And we connect the Nali system and extend it, it's actually a low-cost solution to the problem of flooding during storm events. It's a relatively inexpensive way of collecting gray water that can be filtered and recycled until the time when underground storm water drains can be constructed. So bioswales at Nali junctions can be planted with shrubs and trees, thereby introducing greenery into the town. So this mapping of site hydrology showed overflow areas where water collects and stagnates these points. And to treat the stagnant water as well as prevent the polluted water from flowing into the river, we propose underground filtration basins in three locations on the north, uh, west, and south of the settlement. So the moat, um, this is the Jaldurg, and um, it's the bridge connecting the settlement uh, um, with the uh, fort. Um, the moat is covered with algae, and part of it is used for seasonal farming. The moat need, really needs more water. Um, and if we were to, there are you know natural dikes here, and if we were to uh, use one of the natural dikes uh, to um, build a weir, then water can be stored and it can be periodically released uh, into the moats through a Swiss gate in the dry season. So the moat was, um, the, uh, as I said, a tributary stream, Adwar of River Betwa. And really, you know, it was meant as a, you know, as a kind of a defensive element, but today in these times, instead of dividing the uh, island from the town, it can be a seam uniting them. The moat has little water during dry seasons, but with water released from the weir upstreams, it has a potential of becoming a riparian habitat corridor. We proposed a number of wetlands um, in the moat that can filter up to 60% of the gray water collected from the Nalis in Orcha. The contaminants can be filtered in a series of cascading pools, thus cleansing the water downstream. And this is a self-sustaining ecosystem that can adapt well to variable uh, water flows. So if encroachments are removed and the street along the moat uh, can also function as a view corridor with rest stops for taking in the magnificent views of the citadel. And these picturesque views can be enjoyed all along this, of um, uh, the fort rising out of the waters, right from the town entry, um, at the, uh, from the town center at the entry to the island fort until we reach the cenotaphs on the riverfront. This view corridor should be protected. The stretch can be redesigned as a street promenade with view and rest spots leading down to the moat. 
with amenities such as seating, convenience shops, information booth, lighting, seating, and trees on the widened sidewalk, visitors will be encouraged to walk down to reach the riverfront. So what I've shown today is that Orcha's immense cultural heritage is intertwined with the river um, in the siting and design of its monuments, in the cultural landscape, which is mnemonic of the Ramayana narrative. The forests of Betwa and its boulder-strewn riverfront are a wilderness preserve today because of the rich flora and fauna. But what should not be forgotten is that natural and cultural heritage are interdependent. They're not dichotomous, as we see here in this landscape of Orcha. And a sustainable conservation approach needs to be an integrated one. So I'll be happy to talk more um, uh, if you have specific questions. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for the wonderful session. I would ask uh, all the participants to, if, if they are having any questions, they can ask directly to ma'am. So since uh, Orcha is, how far away from uh, Bhopal is Orcha? Is it? 350 kilometers from Bhopal, ma'am, and uh, mm -hmm. I have visited there a number of times. So, uh, yeah. 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 it's a very serene, very picturesque place. Can one cannot resist walking on the riverside the entire day? That's and, true. Yeah, and heritage laid in at every footstep. So. And this is all. This is riparian zone. I mean, if you really think about it, you know, all of these tributaries, you know, the Sadhara. What they, I don't know if there are actually seven streams or not, but uh, there are plenty, you know, of streams. And uh, uh, the builders of Orcha just took advantage, uh, you know, of uh, of uh, this kind of um, uh, you know uh, tributary formation um, to construct the fort. And the fort is massive. I mean. You know, yeah, it's well constructed. Uh, it's, I think, one of the strongest of uh, of all the Bandela forts. Uh, although some are actually even more uh, picturesque <laughs> and more precariously balanced on hills. <laughs> and there are uh, vulture habitats also very close by. I believe there are a few nesting sites, yes. which are very few in uh, remaining in India. So mm. some of them are quite close to the fort in the uh, hills. Mm. Yeah. But I wonder how many uh, actually know that um, this uh, wilderness uh, is uh, consists of um, sites from all over India, which are associated with Ramayana. So in a way, you know, this has become a cultural landscape. The wilderness has become a cultural landscape uh, because of the uh, relationship, you know, between the, and the naming of um, these places um, after other places in India. So I think this is a very interesting example, actually, of uh, cultural heritage and natural heritage together. Because uh, uh -huh. we tend to think of them as, you know, you know, natural heritage, you know, is you it's it's uh, to be studied uh, you know as a as an ecologist word and cultural heritage is to be studied you know by anthropologists and um, conservationists and um, but really a landscape is kind of a meeting ground uh, for the two. Uh, any questions, guys? Is there any question? Deepika. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Ma'am, uh, it was so nice uh, seeing your work. I've read your papers or published before on cultural landscape. And I stay close to Western Ghats. And I don't know if you're familiar with Kolur, Mukambika. It's, uh, it's a pristine hill where uh, Sri Shankaracharya is supposed to have attained uh, enlightenment. Oh, oh. Yeah, and uh, there is a uh, source of a river a tributary called Agni Tirtha, which is supposed to have uh, some power to heal diseases. It comes from that hill, and it has uh, medicinal value due to the herbs of uh, 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 you know growing on that hill. And base of that hill, they have uh, made a temple, which is uh, very well known or popular here. And when you were telling, this was hitting me very much that. 
before this was uh, meant only for people who wanted to do meditation or you know give uh, uh, kind of a serene thing it was very difficult because there is rivers on both both sides it was very difficult to reach there and it had more of a natural landscape which was the like you said the heritage uh, whereas now the temple has become very popular bridges have been built and thousands flock in and it has uh, the tirtha sthana has become a sewage line and uh, the hill has been encroached with roads and the uh, trees are disappearing the uh, herbal values or the values have totally gone no one remembers them the natural landscape has totally been overpowered with all the donations there is a lot of donations coming to the temple it's very rich and that's become the downfall of that whole place the carrying capacity is not looked at at all the natural uh, you know the facility, uh, setting is not respected at all so when you were talking of orcha i was just relating it to that example and i was thinking how people totally negate the natural heritage in uh, uh, in terms of respecting culture I mean, okay, how okay. culture is given importance as the um, in terms of stories and building huge complexes and uh, flocking for pilgrimage, but not the whole source of that story was the nature, which right, is not right, respected right. at all. And nothing has been done. There's so much money in there. Anything could have been done, and a lot of land is under the temple uh, authority also, which is not being used. Uh, so I mean, it's quite sad state of affairs here. And when you were talking, I was just saying, if nature was looked as heritage, as important for culture, as the built form, or the stories, it would have been so nice for these places like this. But I hope all is not lost, and that awareness uh, raising, you know, uh, will uh, lead to. Um, uh, through presentations, drawing attention to um, natural heritage, uh, possibly getting the help of uh, temple um, priests uh, uh, and other stakeholders, because I don't think they have forgotten uh, this. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, this culture is, you know, uh, this, this uh, link, this relationship with nature is still very much alive in um, in in uh, practices and traditional practices. It's just that development is occurring at such an accelerated pace that uh, it seems like it's like, you know, uh, a steamroller and you've got to push it back, you know. Yeah, I guess, I mean, uh, right. I was just thinking that we should uh, at least try uh, to make a report, like you said, give a justification and a proof of what can be done when nature is respected and how the whole place can be turned over. Especially uh, when you see the water becoming a sewage line, it's very depressing. And today no one takes a dip in that ghat, which used to be mm -hmm. the main attraction mm -hmm. or uh, main part of the story. The Agni Tita Stala, actually it was a Tita Stala and it's not being uh, used anymore because of the sewage that is put into it. Could there be, you know, some funds from, uh, uh, you know, which are earmarked for uh, for pilgrim sites um, that can be, um, you know, that can be applied for to clean up uh, uh, the stream? The stream. Uh, actually, we did talk to them about uh, uh, a kind of a treatment. Actually, uh, uh, S. Vishwanath sir was with us when we did that workshop with the temple. Uh, to uh, propose a partial treatment along the river and a sewage treatment plant they were working on. But uh, somehow they were more into encroaching land of the forest for it and making a big folk row project which didn't have funds to run. Like the temple uh, sponsored the installation of a treatment system which cannot be run with the funds that the panchayat has. Like all the pilgrims are funding the temple not the place so mm -hmm. to run the uh, treatment system or whatever the panchayat didn't have funds so that was a uh, kind of a, a kind of a failing uh, system because 
we were saying that you have to uh, put it in such a way that it can run itself uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. and it cannot be a solution which can be just uh, done for the namesake that we have done something for the waste so um, yeah we did propose a lot of things we submitted the report but i don't think uh, it's been implemented it takes time it takes and it's really important for the temple you know much uh, to cooperate uh, because they're sitting on you know <laughs> uh, you know they're sitting on large funds you know which should be directed for public um, uh, public places and public services uh. it's it's uh, it's not uh, you know if there, when there are precedents you know things will happen now that we see the ganga uh, uh, massive efforts are being uh, undertaken to clean the ganga and hopefully yamuna too the smaller rivers would follow cleaning up the smaller rivers would follow uh, by the way i i don't know too much about uh, the linking of ken with betwa i just read it in the newspapers uh, uh, is that going forward? Um, for those of you who live in Madhya Pradesh, you probably know what's going on these days. A few rivers have been interlinked. I am not uh, very updated. I am not updated about Kin Betwa, but uh, Shipra has been linked to others' rivers, and there. So this work is in progress. A few, few have started receiving water from other receive. Uh, like Shipra River had dried off, so now it is also receiving some waters from Narmada. Oh, good for oh, and this is no gen. Yeah, because now otherwise, how will the kumbh happen? Naturally, <laughs> the river is unable to uh, heal itself. So uh, mm -hmm. are these such uh, artificial measures are now being taken to um, like revive the older systems? So yeah. Very thank you for the question, Deepika ma'am. Uh, Deepika ma'am is the uh, head of department at Manipal Institute of Technology. And uh, so a very valid question, ma'am. I think yeah, people participation and uh, their sensitization can make uh, these proposals a success without even them understanding uh, the intention of our proposal. So I think public participation will shall go in hand in hand. and these various stakeholders also need to be educated upon the implications of their development. Yeah, uh, and we need more legislation, right? Uh, ma'am, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, ma'am, I have a question to you. Uh, ma'am, mm -hmm. uh, wo what, uh, what guidelines can work in management of these historical cultural management sites? So whether one should have some kind of a, uh, policy framework for like this is how traditional agricultural practices were carried out and should be continued in the same manner or the residential settlements uh, they should follow a particular style of architecture or the built open space ratio or uh, uh, the connectivity so uh, like what is the next step of development of cultural and uh, so that we can retain the fragile nature culture balance in uh, the it, sites. Yeah, it has to be an integrated framework uh, for conservation. And I think a landscape oriented framework for conservation is an integrated one because landscape integrates all forms of heritage, you know, natural, cultural, it's a site and setting for intangible also. In the case of Orcha, uh, integrated framework would mean, well, you know, Orcha is um, very unique. Uh, it's a small settlement. Uh, uh, it's got really interesting um, architecture, uh, temple and Palatine architecture, but also vernacular architecture. So um, uh, the appeal of the place really, you know, lies um, primarily in its built fabric and of course in, also in, in the Betwa, of course. Uh, built fabric, um, the riverfront, and then uh, it is um, also a very, very important place for celebration of festivals in this part of, um, of Bundelkhand. Um, so all, all of those um, 
come together, tangible, natural, cultural, architectural heritage come together. And an integrated framework would mean that um, we think holistically, um, we need to have um, uh, a legislative framework to back that up. Um, so coordination at various levels, in the case of Orcha between um, uh, the forest department, the, who run the wildlife sanctuary, the archeological department who's in charge of the fort area, then um, the uh, then the town and its um, you know its its various te temples. Uh, um, so uh, usually, you know, um, it is um, in bigger cities as a development authority. There is no such thing as there here in Orcha, but there is a municipality. And if these departments uh, can have very specific guidelines. Uh, which are backed up by legal mandate. Um, so much, this is the buffer zone, you know, for protection. Like you'll be grappling with this issue of um, how much of the riparian zone should be uh, should be protected and cannot be, you know, built upon. Um, so that is, you know, that's the most important thing. You know, it can the whole gel can this whole island uh, become a protected area so that, you know, whatever is going on inside the island, not just the historic monuments, but also the wells, you know, um, there are gardens here. Um, uh, there is this forest um, growth. Um, all of that is protected. Similarly, um, here, the east-west and the north-south streets are lined with beautiful um, houses. Um, you know, they, these houses are a little depressed below the uh, road level, um, and uh, they're painted blue. You know, they have um, otas, and um, they have a very neat uh, vocabulary, design vocabulary uh, that uh, makes the experience of walking down a street a very pleasant one, because each house, you know, has the same kind of design elements repeating after each other. So the new um, construction that is happening uh, should really follow um, a pattern book of uh, for um, design detailing. Uh, I know many homestays were coming up in that time and I'm sure they are still there's you know they're, they're flourishing because Orcha is really a hot spot you know for international tourism. So it's in their interest, you know, to not destroy the architectural character um, and the human scale of the place. Plus infrastructure development, as you said, you know, septic tanks, more septic tanks, uh, 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 signage for sure. You know, there is signage, but it is kind of minimal. And you know, like the signs that are at the uh, fort, uh, <laughs> they're not complete. You know, we you know when we mapped the area, we found that there was like some discrepancy. So they really, I mean, there's a very good uh, audiovisual sound and light show uh, in the evenings uh, about the Bundelas. But really, I think ASI should take this more seriously: lighting and signage, and trees. Yes, ma'am. I think we need to take these studies ahead and develop some strong framework so that we are able to protect the uh, beautiful cultural landscape which our country possesses, and that too diverse, which is very unique for a region. Uh, uh, ma'am, I have a question. Uh, uh, like, water and rivers, uh, uh, water, especially rivers and stables, are playing and playing a very important role for the social gatherings since ages in India. Like, mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we are having the examples like Banaras, Allahabad, and you know, Ujjain. So, mm -hmm. as a landscape architect, and nowadays, you know, uh, the riverfront development has came into the picture. So yeah. as a landscape architect, how do we need to focus to have these kind of spaces? You know, like uh, there is, uh, they used to tell the relationship between women and water. And, uh, so uh, nowadays, how, how do we need to proceed to have these kind of spaces? 
So a riverfront development, what would be the right uh, direction for riverfront development? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. OK, not all rivers have ghats. Uh, wherever the ghats are, you know, they're really beautiful public spaces, and they should be preserved. I mean, the most famous ones, of course, are Varanasi and uh, Mathura and Vrindavan. Um, uh, and in um, uh, other places, you know, the access to the river, you have to kind of study how it happens. Uh, if it is not ghat building, then uh, what is it? Uh, uh, because um, uh, if we were to, like, you know, big cities, urban development, riverside development really, you know, uh, follows, uh, you know, like rivers, uh, you know, Parisian river saying, you know, <laughs> like a hardscape. <laughs> um, but, uh, and that's, I guess, what the hearts were also like. But um, it doesn't have to be that way. I, I, I think... Uh, that um, we need to think creatively about access of local communities into to the river, um, looking at, you know, uh, uh, of course, historic structures and the sacred sites, um, um, thinking about, um, you know, the floodplain and uh, uh, what does it support besides farming, um, uh, mm, Thinking about uh, you know uh, a more natural vegetal vege vegetated um, riverfront that can um, kind of harken back to the groves you know um, idea of the groves um, lining you know lining the uh, rivers uh, say in Ayodhya uh, for instance um, uh, all the descriptions in Ramayana. And in the Purans, describe uh, you know um, the ancient cities as being surrounded by upvans and vans. I think that we have to think you know more about about this you know how to create a natural naturalistic um, uh, uh, landscape uh, that can be uh, of benefit you know. It, uh, ecologically speaking, but also can um, uh, can be spaces, you know, for people uh, um, uh, to gather. Uh, uh, gatherings don't have to really take place, you know, in large plazas. You know, they can be clearings, for instance. Um, they can be in a dance. Um, so I, I think what we what is necessary is to develop a kind of a palette of uh, solutions, a kind of a vocabulary for riverfronts mm -hmm. that can be very much culturally sensitive and ecologically, you know, to. Uh, thanks a lot, ma'am. Uh, any other questions, uh, guys? If if you are having any any other uh, questions. Hello, ma'am. This is Gayatri uh, I had uh, been with uh, with you in the Ayodhya workshop uh, two years back, uh, from Yes, hello. Yeah, hello. So hello. Uh, I have a hello. Hello, Gayatri, are you there? Have we lost her? I think she has lost connection. Maybe you can just put the question in the chat or something. Gayatri, can you put your question in the chat box? Meanwhile, any other question, if, uh, if anybody has any other question? Yes, uh, my name is Neha and I'm an environmental planner. Uh, mm -hmm. My, I have a comment and a question. Um, yes. I think the the era where the ghats were provided for a, were for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And in today's context, maybe that purpose is defunct right now. 
so should we keep celebrating uh, the the heritage or the historic uh, purposes or we should move beyond uh, you know and cater to the needs and uses and the you know purposes of today and um, is it always necessary to have a direct physical access to the river instead of a visual access only well in some places uh, definitely um, you know ghats are going to be continue to remain important because places like varanasi where you know 100000 pilgrims uh, you know want to take the do the snan on you know kartik punima so ghats are perfectly uh, uh, a perfect you know for uh, for getting access uh, to the uh, to the waters um but you but you you make an important point not uh, Uh, not all rivers are as sacred uh, as ganga yamuna uh, godavari or you know kaveri are um, many rivers are uh, to be enjoyed you know for the phenomenal properties uh, you know the citizenry wants to be clo- get access to to the river to enjoy the breeze to enjoy the views um, uh, for boating um, and which is why i say that uh, we need to develop a vocabulary for riverfront development uh, that is not destructive of the river's ecology um so you should not make the mistake you know of uh, of say what has happened in the us or in uh, uh, where you know rivers are simply channelized or a lot of industrial activities occurred on the river factory these are you know warehouses and factories were built and that kind of closed off the river uh from the city uh in india you know industrialization has not been that much uh, and uh, uh though it wherever it has occurred it needs you know again the river water so i i think if we were to um uh to think about um uh rivers as uh Uh, not as backwaters anymore but as a you know source for um uh creating a rich public life in a town in a in a provincial city uh, we need to you know put in <laughs> effort um uh to to design the river front well yes that is a very valid take away from the research we need to start building up this vocabulary ma'am we and uh, or develop which and these have uh, these des- these designs have taken millions or uh, thousands of years to evolve and uh, so one need to also understand the uh, rational or how because of need they emerged and uh, how can they be now taken ahead well every river tells its own story i think every city has you know has is on a river <laughs> mostly cities are on rivers all the cities have been uh, and they have their own story uh, their own ecology and i i would you know just um study the river you know <laughs> uh, uh, in all its moods um, and uh, um and the relationship between the city and the river and then go from there uh, because rivers you know some rivers have become you know dry and they become narrow but some some flood um and uh, then how do you deal you know with um, uh with the river as a as as a uh, something that kind of changes you know from time to time from season to season but they are a great resource you know to to a city uh, uh ma'am gayatri has uh, Gay- gayatri is asking uh, how do you bring about the same connect to the rivers in urbanized part of the city which can only be seen in the religious course of cultural cities um i'm not sure i uh, would you explain it a little bit for me the question ma'am i think what gayatri means to uh, what gayatri means is uh how can uh, people can be reassociated in urban areas with the river fronts like there were cultural connections uh, like the, in but now we have gated colonies 
and uh, mm. newer river fronts so mm. uh, there is not much there is the cultural association has weakened a lot so what are the measures or what are the design strategies that can be taken if we want to uh, revive the uh, culture nature linkages in urban area and many of those religious connotations have also been lost so the people of the present and the upcoming generation are very much and they do not uh, they have only seen water coming out of the taps and not from the rivers fresh flowing rivers so the connection has changed a lot that is true that um, you know you just you know can't um, you know walk down to the village stream anymore or to, like in lucknow for instance um, you know gomti is really become the backwaters but at one time you know 150 years ago um, it was a primary transportation artery it was a you know on the banks of gomti the nawabi palaces were built you know it was a great source of uh, of breezes views um, um and 150 years later in uh, post colonial lucknow um as the city has grown um you know flat plain of gomti has has been built upon um and uh, the new newer you know development uh, the big parks that have been built you know by mayawati um uh, uh, and other parties are simply not responding to the river but that is a you know that's a um, really a missed up opportunity um i i wouldn't say that people don't people will not uh, have um, will not enjoy the river uh, because they don't because for them water comes out of the tap i i think it's 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 very intrinsic to us to to be want to be close to the to to water um it's great so you know it's it's uh, it's a great source of pleasure <laughs> um and um every set, every city really needs public spaces too so uh, uh, uh the the river bank uh, you know even the flood plain uh, can be uh, a protected zone where um uh, where no with uh, no buildings no construction is allowed but um, but instead parks uh, uh, based on the idea of groves can be can be made um, so that um people have access not only to the to the river but also to to greenery um yes ma'am i think yeah we need this for the uh, better health and well-being of the society uh, yes so that will and i think these connections will happen very soon as the design is instill is an instigator of such changes so once we have a better designed open space it starts attracting uh, people and uh, there are people uh, who like uh, what i see in bhopal itself there are trees right in the median if there is an avla tree or a people tree mm-hmm. people start tying knots or in avla navmi they perform that ritual over there because yes. they do not have a temple complex anymore with large backyard where these trees are there so i think uh, we have a great section and the rural population is also enormous i think more than 70% in india uh, where mm-hmm. there is still a very strong association so if we provide the opportunity mm-hmm. these things will happen back again and uh, 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 there is this knowledge also traditional knowledge which is present there maybe it can be revived mm-hmm. yes it's important to envision uh, to these envisioning exercises uh, to to bring them in the public domain uh, to persuade um, you know the stakeholders to think in a collective way uh, for the for the think in terms of uh, riverfront as a public good thank you ma'am it was a very interesting presentation and i think our students will be making uh, all the participants and our students will be making the cultural uh, conservation uh, cultural landscape map of their study zones so your study is very useful and it has shown how cultural landscapes can be mapped for conservation how can their value assessment what are the sources one can what is the process that one can follow to interpret the cultural landscape so it it was a very useful and interesting presentation thank, thank you so much for sharing
Thank you and all the best. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful lecture and uh, uh, giving the information about the natural and cultural landscape of uh, Orcha and Betwa and uh, give, uh, telling the relationship uh, relationship between men and water and how they celebrated their you know cultural cultural and religions with the water so thanks a lot it was very informative session a wonderful session ma'am thank you all right